me after the service. Amen, amen. Well, please welcome out now Pastor John for our Easter sermon. Good morning, Crossway. How are we doing this morning? Awesome. Would you stand with me just one more time? Happy Easter and Feliz Domingo de Resurrección. Ah! I was practicing Feliz Domingo de Resurrección. A little bit better? Okay, there we go. Don't hate me later, Manny. Don't make fun of me later, right? He, saw 2%, he gave me a 2%. All right, hey, I want to start with reading a portion of scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. When I get to the end of it, we're going to make a declaration together. We're going to say, this is the word of the Lord. Here's what he says. Paul writes this, for what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And we say this together, this is the word of the Lord. Can we place our palms up now and just invite the Holy Spirit? Holy Spirit, come. We know that you're here, but what we're asking is that you would show us Jesus more clearly. I pray, Lord, that in this moment and in this space that you would awaken our hearts to you. I pray that every single person that is here today would encounter Jesus in a personal way, that we would see what Christ has done for us, that we would receive it for ourselves, and our lives would be changed by it. So God, break down the walls of resistance. Father, keep our attention on you for these moments and the work that Jesus Christ has done. We ask this in the powerful name of Jesus. And everyone together said, amen. amen. You can be seated. So if you think throughout history, there are certain moments that are kind of like these inflection points in history, that after these moments, everything changed. I'll share three Go all the way back to the 1400s, around 1450, the printing press was invented. Now, that might not sound that amazing, but before this, think about this. Every single book before that had to be handwritten and hand copied, which made books both expensive and rare. And then the printing press was created by a guy by the name of Johannes Gutenberg, a very good German name, if we have any Germans here. Anyone want to guess the first book printed on the printing press? Anybody here? The Bible was the first one. So it's a very safe answer, right? In church, you know, what's the first book? Bible. Okay, that's a really good safe answer. It was the Bible. From that moment on, there was this explosion of writing and printing on science, on philosophy, on politics, and on theology. And that moment literally changed the world. Well, we'll fast forward to another moment. This is one that some of you lived through. Uh, started in the late 1960s and 70s, and then right to the end uh, of the 80s, the internet and ultimately the World Wide Web. Some of you guys remember when that wasn't a thing, and now it is. Now think about how much the internet and online changed our lives. Many of you, before you came here this morning, were already online. You checked the weather. Some of you checked your social media accounts. Some of you checked your emails. Some of you, it's your very first time with us. And so you went onto our website just to make sure we're not crazy. And if you did and you're here, I guess we tricked you, but don't worry. There's always room for one more crazy, so we're glad. We're glad you're here. Here's the deal. Internet, World Wide Web, of course, changed history. It was one of those inflection points. One more. We'll fast forward to today, 2023. So there has been, as some of you guys have been paying attention, a rise in artificial intelligence. How many of you heard of Chat GPT? You guys, uh, yeah, interesting stuff. They can write poetry. They can write uh, screenplays. It can pass the bar exam, which is pretty incredible, doing some Incredible stuff there. Then on the creative side, there's AI like Midjourney, and they've been doing some amazing stuff in the area of design. So, so for example, take, take a look at this image here. Now, I find this to be a really fascinating image, beautiful photograph of a lady sitting outside in a cafe, right? Uh, the only thing about that, it is actually not a photograph of a lady sitting outside in a cafe. That is an AI-generated image that is not a real person and that is not a real place. You just type a little text in, I would like a picture of a lady sitting outside of a cafe, and boom, you get a photo like that. How many of you know that's pretty amazing, right? It's about to change the world. We're an inflection point with artificial intelligence. Now, one of the things that I find interesting, if you think through all of those moments in history, and I think they're all pretty much the same, is that when the moment happens, at the beginning, there's all of this buzz about it. There's all of this excitement. There's all of this enthusiasm. When Gutenberg's press was created, I'm sure people were like, this is amazing, a printing press. Like, that was incredible. But I'm 43 years old, and I have never today heard anyone say the most amazing moment in my life is when I found out about the Gutenberg press. That, like, that doesn't happen. We've moved on. 
Uh, think about uh, the internet, World Wide Web, right? So it was incredible when it was created. You still use it today, everybody in this room, but there is nobody that is still amazed by the World Wide Web, WWW, that doesn't move us. Even artificial intelligence, like that image that I put up there, some of you are like, wow, I can't believe that that was created. Even that image, give it three years, and we will have moved on. That will seem old hat. Now here's why I say that, because that happens through all of these moments in history that change the world. We move on, we move on, we move on. But this morning, I want to talk about the one moment in history that changed history that we have not moved on from. And that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is this really incredible moment because here we are 2,000 years later and there are still people saying, hold up a second, what happened then is changing my life today. In this room, like right now, sitting here, there are many of you that go, listen, my marriage was changed because of the resurrection of Jesus. And my guilt and shame was taken away by the resurrection of Jesus. Man, I was freed from addiction because of the resurrection of Jesus. 2,000 years later, we are still talking about it. And so I want to title this message something really simple. I'm calling it this, The Strange Story of Easter. Can we all say that out loud together? Ready? The Strange Story of Easter. And I'm calling it that because I want to ask the question, why is it that Easter, the resurrection in particular, has been able to continue to be this thing that is changing the world and changing the lives of people 2,000 years later? So to see that, we're going to take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, 1 Corinthians is originally a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the Christians in the ancient city of Corinth. And he writes this, now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the, what's that word there? Say it loud with me, gospel that I preach to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. And then he goes on to say this. He says, uh, he goes on to say this. By this, what's that next word there? Gospel, you are saved if you firmly hold to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. So here's what Paul's saying. He said, here's this message, okay, that I believed, Paul believed. And he goes, and I preached it to you. But I didn't just preach it to you. He says that they what? They received it. So he says, here's this message that I preached to you that you received, and then he says, and it's upon which you've taken your stand. What's that mean? That means that it, they reoriented their life around this message, right? Like this is the thing, they shifted their life because of this message. And he says, it is this message by which you are, does anyone remember what he said? Saved. It's the message by which you are saved. Now, uh, he calls the message something. It's the word that we said out loud together. He calls the message the what? What did he say? The gospel. He calls it the gospel. What I want to do this morning is I want to talk about the gospel. The reason why I want to talk about the gospel is because the more clear you are on what the gospel is and what Jesus did through the gospel, the more you will understand the strange story of Easter and why we still celebrate 2,000 years later that what happened then is changing lives today. So let's talk about the gospel. The New Testament was originally written in the Greek language, and it's been translated to English. So every Bible that you have was originally, in the New Testament, was originally Greek, and, and now it's English. And the Greek word underneath the English word gospel is this word, euangelion. I want you to take a look at that word. Let's all try to say it out loud together. Ready? Euangelion. And since I know you didn't expect to be in a Greek seminar today, so let's say it again, though. But I want to say it this time with a little more sophistication because we're talking Greek here. So the word gospel, Greek word is what? Euangelion. Very nice. Very nice. Now, if you take euangelion in its most literal form, like the most literal wooden translation of euangelion in the Greek, it would be the English words good news. So gospel a Greek word there is euangelion, and the most literal translation would be good news. Now, we use the phrase good news in English for like a whole spectrum of things that don't necessarily have the import or the, the feel of what euangelion was. So, for example, let's say you're in the Publix chip aisle with your wife, and all of a sudden she says, good news. And you're like, what happened? She goes, Doritos are buy one, get one free. How many of you know in the era of inflation, that is good news, right? Can I get an Amen. But that is not euangelion. I mean, it's not what the primary usage of the word euangelion. Or, or, or maybe you're uh, Sawgrass Mills Mall trying to find a parking space during Christmas time. Has anyone ever had to do this before? I think none of you, not, nobody else except me here. How many? Okay, there we go. I feel like Sawgrass Mills Mall parking during Christmas time is like the third level of hell, all right? Just be honest. 
It's like one, two, and then sawgrass mills during Christmas. So you're driving around for 15 minutes, can't find a parking spot, and all of a sudden your kid in the back is like, good news. And you're like, what? That guy's pulling out, Dad. We've got a parking spot. Now, that is good news, but it's not quite euangelion, the primary way the word was originally used. Because the primary way the word euangelion was used in the, in the Greek in that ancient time, because it wasn't originally a religious word, was a declaration of the good news of victory. And that's a big deal in the ancient world. Let's say your city was being attacked and your military is going out to fight or your region or your area is defending itself against an enemy. Whether or not you win or lose that battle made a big difference. Because if you lose that battle and your enemy comes into the ancient world, man, they're going to pillage your stuff. They're going to burn your houses down. They might take your women and children away. They might enslave you. And if they don't, they're going to impose radically high taxes on you. That was a big deal. And that would radically change your life in a bad way. And so if your military was out in battle and they were going up against another opposing army and they won the battle, how would they get the information out to you? Well, the Gutenberg Press hadn't been created, so they couldn't do, you know, pamphlets. And the Internet wasn't around, so they couldn't post it on social. Here's what they would do. They would send out messengers. And the messengers would run into the cities and run into the areas. And the messengers would shout out, Uangelion, which means what? Good news. And it's the good news of victory. Uangelion, the king has won the victory. Uangelion, good news. We will not be enslaved today. Uangelion, good news. We will be free. Uangelion, we have been saved. And Paul takes this Greek word, euangelion, with all of that import of the power of the victory. And he says, hey, Christians, he's talking to the Corinth. He goes, we have an euangelion. We have a good news of victory. And he shares with them what the good news of victory is. And, and I want to share with you what I believe, if I would put together what the good news of victory of the Christian story is. And it is this. The good news is that Jesus Christ conquered sin and death. For us. That's our good news of victory. Jesus Christ conquered sin and death for us. Now keep that up for just a second. I want to pause here. I want to make sure we've all been tracking. So Paul says to the Corinthians, I preach to you the gospel. And then we said that the gospel has a Greek word. What was the Greek word? Say it with me. Euangelion, okay? And, and the Greek word euangelion means what? Say it with me. Good news. But it's not just good news like Bogo at Publix. It is the good news of victory. And it is this. Let's all read this aloud together. Let's read the good news is that Jesus Christ conquered sin and death for us. Now, I want to read it one more time, like you had your Cuban coffee before you came, all right? So, one more time. Let's do it. Ready? The good news is that Jesus Christ conquered sin and death. For, this is the good news. This is the Evangelion on a victory. Now, now, here's the thing. Some of you, you're hearing that. You're like, the good news is that Jesus Christ conquered sin and death, and you're yawning like, yeah, sin and death, yeah, whatever. And, and part of the reason for that it's because a lot of us in this room do not feel like sin and death are an enemy at all for us. Like, you might be sitting here thinking, sin and death. Like, yo, I've got way bigger enemies than sin and death. And, and, and honestly, that's how we feel in our cultural moment. Because I, I think you could agree with this. We live in a very polarized cultural moment. Everybody with me on that? Like, you feel that. And everybody wants you to believe that their enemy is your biggest enemy. And so right now, right, like wherever you're at, there are people who go like, let me tell you your greatest enemy. Your greatest enemy is the other political party. And I say the other because whichever political party, they're going you know, to be like that other political, political party. Now, I'm not saying politics don't matter. They certainly have consequences. But listen to me. Listen to me. That other political party is not your greatest enemy, according to the Bible. Now, you might say, well, I know what the enemy is. This is the one I'm really nervous about, John. Like, it's that, that other country, the rising geopolitical threat of that other nation. And listen, that might be an actual issue, but I'm going to tell you right now, that is not your greatest enemy. You might go, I know what the greatest enemy is, inflation, or South Florida housing costs. Some of you might give me an amen on that. Or my neighbor whose dog is barking at all hours of the night. Some of you are like, Jesus, please save me from that. I get it. Those are real enemies. But here's what I want to say. The greatest enemy that you face is not any of those things. The greatest enemy that you face, according to the Bible, is sin and death. Now, let me explain that because for some of us, you're like, I don't, I don't know. That doesn't move me. So let's just talk about sin for a second. The Bible says this about sin. The Bible says that all of us are born with a sin nature. What does that mean? That doesn't mean that you sin as much as you possibly can. 
You certainly don't. You don't sin as much as you possibly can. Uh, the be born with a sin nature just simply means this, is that you are born with a propensity towards sinfulness. Like a propensity towards doing what you want instead of what God wants. I was born with a propensity towards like, I want to think what John Elswick wants to think, say what John Elswick wants to say, and do what John Elswick wants to do instead of what God wants me to do. And when we do our thing instead of God th God's thing, that is sin. We're born with a sin nature. Now you might say, so what? Like, why does that matter? Why does it? Well, well a lot of reasons it matters. Here's one, and here's why sin is your enemy, because sin disrupts and affects and it destroys your three most important relationships. Number one, your relationship with you. Number two, your relationship with others. And three, your relationship with God. Let's just talk about your relationship with you. Have you ever had this situation where you say something, like words come out of your mouth, and, they're le and as they leave your mouth, you're thinking, I should not have said that. Has anybody ever had that happen? And you're just like, I wish I could take it back, but you can't. And you knew it was wrong to say that, those biting, difficult, painful words. Have you ever had a situation where you did something, like you did it, like you did, and after you did it, immediately you're like, why did I do that? was wrong. I should not have done that. Have you ever had a moment where you thought something, like you were entertaining, entertaining thoughts, and after you're like, why was I thinking those thoughts? Has anyone ever had that happen? Now, have you ever had this happen? After you do that, you say to yourself, I can't believe I said that. I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I thought that. I will never do it again. And then three days pass, and you do it, say it, think it again. Anybody win there? And then, and, and then you go, oh, I can't believe that. Why would I ever do, do that, say that, think that? I will never do it again. And three more days pass, and what happens? You do it again. You know what's amazing to me about sin and our sin nature? We, in our own sin nature, aren't even able to keep our own laws of our own heart. We can't even do what we want to do. We still sin. And causes us guilt and shame for what we've done. So sin disrupts our relationship with us because we can't even keep our own laws. And then we feel guilt and shame because of it. But it doesn't just disrupt that. It also disrupts your relationships with others. The way you interact with others, every single breakdown in any relationship at the root cause, it is sin. It is sin that someone has sinned against you or you've sinned against them. Or very often we both sinned against each other. And that's the root cause of every, every broken relationship. If you have a broken relationship with an old friend, you're like, why did that happen? Here's the deal. Sin, somewhere along the way, your enemy's sin affected that relationship. You look at your marriage, it's been struggling. Let me tell you, somewhere, either the other person or you or both, sin has affected that relationship. Every single relationship breakdown is because of the root cause of sin. And I don't know if you've ever had this happen where you're watching the news, you're watching something online, you're seeing people behave certain difficult way towards each other, and you think to yourself, what is wrong with us? So I've never had that thought, like, what is happening in the world right now? And let me just give you the answer. It is sin. Our enemy is sin. It affects our relationship with ourselves. It affects our relationship with each other. And lastly, but most importantly, it affects your relationship with who? God. Say what I mean by that. What I mean is that because you have sin, the Bible says that that sin has separated you from your most important relationship. Because I'm here to tell you, your most important relationship is not your relationship with your spouse or your kids or your BFF from college or your boss. Your most important relationship is your relationship with your creator, God. And you will never find full satisfaction in any of those other relationships until you have your vertical relationship with God dealt with. It just won't happen. That is the most important relationship. But here's the deal. Sin has so affected us that when we sin, it's ultimately not just against ourselves or against others. It is ultimately against God, and that separates us from God. And some of you feel that. Like some of you are sitting here this morning, and you feel like, honestly, separated from God. You're in a chair here in this church service, and you feel like an outsider looking in. You're an observer. You're watching because God feels far. Maybe you've tried to pray in the past, and it just felt like the heavens were opaque, and God just seemed so distant. Why? 
Why is it that God seems far? Because there's this thing that has separated you and I from God. It's this thing called sin. Your enemy is sin. I'm telling you, greater than any of those other enemies that we spend our time thinking about, sin is your enemy, okay? Not just sin. I said that the good news, the euangelion, is that Jesus Christ conquered sin and what? Does anyone remember? Death. Now, death is a big deal because it doesn't matter how wealthy you are, how smart you are, how beautiful you are, how influential you are, a hundred out of a hundred of, of us are going to have to deal with death. It is no respecter of persons. It is an enemy that we don't like to think about, but is literally there. And then the Bible says not only just physical death, but because we've sinned against a holy God, we merit, we deserve the wages of sin is eternal death, eternal separation from God. That's the place we find ourselves in. And I know we want to think of so many other enemies, but I am telling you this morning, the biggest enemies that you face are sin and death. And the gospel and the euangelion and the good news of the Christian story is that Jesus Christ has conquered sin and death for you. Now, how does he do that? Well, Paul describes how he does it in two ways. And I want you to see the first way that he conquered sin and death for us. It says this, verse 3. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. Here's the first way that Jesus defeated sin and death, okay? He says this, that Christ, what are those next four words? Read them with me. Died for our sins. He says that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was buried. Now we hear that, okay? So Paul's like, listen. You had sins, I had sin, we deserve punishment because of our sins, but here's Jesus, he's going he's to claim victory over sin, here's how he does it, he dies for your sins. Now some of us hear that and it just, like we've heard it, and like, yeah, what does that really mean? And, and so let me explain, here's what happened, God loved you in your sin so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, God the Son, to come to the earth, to take on flesh, to dwell among us as your substitute, and then here's what Jesus does. He goes to the cross, and on the cross, he takes on, he pays the penalty of death for your sins that you deserve. That's what Jesus did. He pays them for you. He pays the penalty you deserve. Now, I know we hear that, and we're kind of like, okay, we did it. Oh, that's interesting. Whatever. But, but I want to I lean into that for a second. Because I think the idea that Jesus Christ paid the penalty for your sins is a radically scandalous idea. It's an idea worth celebrating. I think about it like this. I remember... The very first speeding ticket I ever got. I was 19 years old. Now, how many of you remember the very first speeding ticket you ever got? Anybody remember that? Some of you can't remember because you had too many. Right? Let's just be honest. You've had a lot. Right? If you're sitting next to someone like that, just wave your hand so we know. Oh, yeah, they've had way more than their fair share. Now, I remember the two things about the speeding ticket. First, I remember I was driving on Sheridan Street out west, and I was speeding. I was going too fast. And I was driving with a friend. And my friend said, John, um, you are speeding. And I, I don't remember the exact words, but I specifically remember the essence of my response, was, which was something like this. <laughs> speeding. I never get pulled over. I speed all the time. I guess God loves me more than he loves you. And I continued to speed. Now, I didn't get pulled over that day. Okay, I didn't. But the very, I'm not lying, the very next day. I'm driving on Pines Boulevard. I'm going west. I normally would turn on Dykes Road. But this time, for whatever reason, I thought, ah, nah, today, maybe I'll take the back roads. I turn on the back roads. The speed limit is 30. I'm going 45. And what do you think happens that moment? I get what? Pulled over. And you know, guys, it is like, I don't know if this may be one of the most humiliating moments. The police officer walks. He points at you. You, over there. And you're like, oh, I'm a sinner. I'm a lawbreaker. I'm a, does anyone know what I'm talking about? Right? Just like, oh, I stink. And. I got my very first speeding ticket. I don't remember how much it was. Let's call it $250. Now, I want you to envision a different, an alternate ending to that story, okay? So I'm driving. He goes, you, to the side. I'm like, center. And I go over to the side, give him my license and registration. He, he writes the ticket. He comes back to me. Imagine this. He gives me my stuff back. He shows me I owe $250. And then he says to me, this to me. He says, uh, sir, you were speeding. To which I say, officer, yes, I was. I admit I am guilty. I was speeding. Then he says, and you broke the law. Officer, I, I, yes, I did. I, 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 I uh, broke the law. And imagine he says, and you deserve this ticket. To which I'm like, eh, do I really? Oh, but yeah, yes, yeah, sorry, officer, yes, I, I deserve the ticket. And then, and then he says, 
and you deserve to pay the fine of $250. Yes, officer, sir, yes, I deserve to pay the fine of $250. Now imagine in that moment, he gets out his wallet, and he takes out two $100 bills and a $50 bill, and he folds it up, and he hands it to me, and he says, young man, today I'm going to pay the penalty that you deserved. Go and speed no more, and I drive away. Now, i got to be honest with you. If that actually happened, that would be like the best story of my life. I would say that story every Sunday. You'd get tired of hearing it. That would be the most amazing story. Like this random cop, like, paid the 250 that I deserve my penalty. He took it for me. And I'll think about this. If that happened to you, how would you respond? Let's say after service today, you're just so blown away by the message. It's so touched your heart that you continue to speed. And as you're speeding, you get pulled over. And you have 250 and the cop says, here's your $250. How would you respond? Let me tell you what you do. You would take your phone out and you say, police officer, can I take a selfie with you? And you'd, you'd post a story on Instagram, hashtag good cop, paid the penalty that I deserve. He would be on Good Morning America the next day. He would be like a write-up in the Sun Sentinel. Good cop, pays the penalty for reckless 19-year-old. You know, like the whole deal. All of that. It would be the story. Why? Because no one ever pays the penalty for someone else that someone else deserved, but Jesus did. And he didn't pay $250. The Bible says that the wages of our sin, the payment for our sin is, is death. Jesus paid the penalty with his life. He took it for you. He died for you. And, and when I say, listen, this is important. When I say he died for you, I don't mean that in some like really generic general way. He died for y'all. He died for ustedes, all of you, like in like the nameless, faceless blob of people. No, I want you to hear this this morning. When I say he died for you, I mean specifically he died for you sitting here. Like it could be that you walked in this morning and you were like, why in the heck am I coming to a church service? I don't believe any of this. I just want you to know that Jesus, in his love, died for your sins. And maybe you're here this morning, and, and you just feel like when I was talking about how our sin affects our relationship with ourselves and our relationship with others and all of this, you just felt the weight of that. Because you're dealing with your own brokenness right now and your own sinfulness right now. And you're just like, man, I, you might not even feel worthy to walk in the doors. You're like, man, if I walk, that place is going to burn down. You know, like that was you. I just want you to know that Jesus died for you. And if you're here this morning and you feel unseen or unloved, I want you to know that Jesus died for you. It's not just a general thing. It is a personal thing. How did Jesus defeat sin and death? He took the penalty on the cross that you specifically and I specifically deserve. But that's not the end. And this is really important. Not only did he die, but listen to what Paul says next. Back to verse 3. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried. But pay attention here because this is the Easter story. And this is the hope that he had, that we have, that he was. And what are those next few words? Let's read them together. Raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. And then he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep, which means dies, died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. Here's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying is this is how Jesus dealt with our sin. This is how Jesus, uh, Jesus conquered our sin and death. He died on the cross for our sins, and then he rose again. Now listen, this is really important that he rose again, because if the story ends with Jesus' death, you and I would not still be celebrating it 2,000 years later. And here's how I know that. Because you take the 1 to 200 years before Jesus, and the 1 to 200 years after Jesus, historically, there were other people who claimed to be the Messiah, like there are other people who would stand up and say they're a Messiah. As a matter of fact, there was what, what, what I might call a Messiah cycle. And here's how the Messiah cycle would work. Someone would stand up and be like, follow me. I'm the Messiah. And there would be a group of people like, you're the Messiah. We will follow you. And then anyone want to guess what would happen to that Messiah? They would be violently killed. And then the crowd would have to be like, what do we do now? Do we just give up? We follow another Messiah. And sure enough, another guy would be like, no, follow me. I'm here. I'm the Messiah. And they'd say, you're the Messiah. And he'd have a crowd. And then guess what would happen? He'd be 
violently killed. And this would happen over and over and over throughout history. Now let me ask you just a little pop quiz question. Um, can anybody name any of those other messiahs or people who claim to be the messiahs in the one to two hundred years before or after Jesus? Anybody got any of those names? You know why you don't have any of those names? Because if you claim to be the Messiah, the Son of God, and then you die, it's done. Like, you're not. So when Jesus Christ didn't just die, but rise again, here's what he did. He proved that everything he said about himself was actually true. A pastor recently said this, if a man predicts their own death and resurrection and pulls it off, we should go with whatever that person says. I think he's right. Like, if, like it's one thing if you can go, I, I can predict where artificial intelligence is going to go. And you're right. We're going to go like, wow, we're going to follow you on social. But if you can predict I'm going to die and rise again, that's a whole different level. Is everybody with me? Now, so so if, if you can rise again, then that proves that who you say you are is actually True. Now, not only that, and here, here's the important part, the resurrection of Jesus proves that who he says he is is true, but the resurrection of Jesus proves that he indeed conquered sin and death for us. Here's how. He indeed conquered sin. Here's how we know it, because his, his, the, the wages of sin is death. Jesus dies, and he comes back to life, proving that the Father accepted the sacrifice of the Son. How do we know that he defeated death? Well, he didn't stay in the grave. And if there's a person who can defeat death, then death is no longer has the final word. Now Jesus has the final word. So here's the gospel. Here's the, what's the Greek word there again? Say it with me. Euangelion. Here's the good news. Jesus Christ conquered sin and death for us. Now back to my opening question. I call this message of the strange story of Easter, and I said I wanted to call it that because the question I had was, why is it that that event 2,000 years ago, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, is one we still celebrate, it's one we still talk about, is we still, people still say it's changing my life, here's why. Okay, here's why the strange story of Easter is still being celebrated today. It's because the past moment of Jesus' resurrection has present power to change your life. I'm going to say it again. Past moment of Jesus' resurrection has present power to change your life. Like what he did then, there was a power (laughs) that happened and is still available to you today 2,000 years later. That's why there are people in the room who go like, Jesus changed everything for me because the past moment of Jesus' resurrection has present power to change their life. That's why people in the room say, it changed my marriage, it changed my, my, took my shame and guilt away, it gave me purpose, it gave me peace. Because the past moment of Jesus' resurrection has the present power to change your life. Now walk with me. Let me just explain to you the present power to change your life. Because I want you to know what is available to you. Because really what I'm doing today, my whole goal is just to proclaim the good news of victory of what Jesus Christ has done and invites you into it. So listen, here's what Jesus has done. Because of his death and resurrection. And because he conquered sin and death, number one, you can be freely forgiven. No matter what you've done, no matter what you've said, no matter where you've been, no matter how far you feel you are from God, no matter how distant God seems to you, no matter how many times you've mocked him, you can be freely forgiven because Jesus paid the penalty of sin. Now you could be in the room and you just feel like, I don't really feel worthy of being forgiven. Forgiven, And it's not about you being worthy of being forgiven. Guess what it's about? It's about how much Jesus loves you. He loves you. And so you can be fully and freely forgiven. What that means is that when God forgives you, when you come to him and you believe in him, which we'll get to in a minute, when you do that, God takes your sins and he washes you completely clean. I don't mean like halfway clean. Have you ever put something in the laundry that was kind of dirty because your kids got it real dirty and you put it in the laundry and you take it out and it's still kind of stained? Does that ever happen to you? You're like, let me try that again. And it's still kind of stained. Let me try. But like, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking when Jesus forgives you, he fully forgives you. The language of the, of the Old Testament is God takes your sins and he throws them as far as the east is from the west. This is what Jesus does. You can be fully and freely forgiven. Number one. Number two is that you can become a new creation. The Bible says that when you believe in Christ, it's like, it's, it's not just like I'm ascribing to a particular religious viewpoint. 
When you believe in Christ, you literally become a new creation. The Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. And God begins to give you the power to change how you live in the future. So before, you did not have the power to overcome sin. But when you become a new creation, you do. You can be a different person. You are a new creation through the power of the resurrection. So you're forgiven. You become a new creation. Here's the third one, is that you are brought into a relationship with God. See, that's what I want to tell you. Listen, when you believe in Jesus, it's not just believing. It's being brought into relationship with your creator. The distance between you and God is taken away. And you're brought into that relationship. And the last thing is this, that when you believe in him, not only do you have a relationship with him now, but you then have a relationship with your creator that lasts throughout eternity, past death. God says, you will be with me eternally. And this is what Christ has done. Like this is the victory and the power that is available to you because what he did 2,000 years ago. But here's the deal. The only way... That, that, like, you can experience that. The only way you can know that, the only way you can receive that is for you to take hold of it and receive it for yourself. I love what Paul said. Back to the first verse that I read. He says this. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, the good news of victory, the euangelion, which you, what's that word? Say it with me. Receive. They had to receive it. Which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are what? Saved. The only way you can be saved is if you receive what Christ has done for you. You have to make that choice for yourself. There's this website, Florida website. It is called fltreasurehunt.gov. floridatreasurehunt.gov. And, and here's what it's about. And you might think that seems like a strange site. Here, here's what the say, site is all about. It is, it is about you finding unclaimed property that belongs to you. And I don't mean like physical property. It's like let's say you had a bank account that you forgot about. I don't know how that happens, but apparently that happens. Let's, let's say there's some stock dividends that are due to you. There's a rebate that's due to you or something along those lines. There's money out there that is for you. After a period of time, the company gives it over to the Florida. And Florida holds it. has this whole database and, and it's just sitting there. Like, it's your money, and it's just sitting there. This actually happened to Crossway Church. We, we did a little thing, Crossway Church, and we found that we, it was like 400 and some dollars that belonged to us. It was already ours. It was just sitting out there. And, but the only way you can get access to it is you have to claim it for yourself. You have to receive it for yourself. And the same thing is true with Jesus. Like 2,000 years ago, Jesus defeated sin and death for you, right? He conquered it. Which means you can be forgiven. Which means you can, have a, a, you can be a new creation. Which means you can have a relationship with God and you can have eternal life. All of that is available to you, but you have to receive it for yourself. I remember my wife, maybe 23 years ago or so, she walked into a church service, did not have a relationship with God. Her friend had invited her in. She sat through the service and as she was hearing the message of the gospel and what Jesus Christ had done for her, at the very end, when he, He gave an opportunity for her to receive it. She turned to her friend and she says, why have I never heard this before? Today is my day. I just want to say there's some of you here this morning that today is the day that God wants you to receive for yourself what Jesus Christ accomplished for you through his death and his resurrection. Now, the two ways I want to sort of invite you into that. Here, here's the first way I want to invite you into that. And the, the first group of people I want to talk to. Number one, there's some of you here, if you actually believe this, and you have believed this for yourself. Like when I talk about what Jesus Christ has done, you're like, yeah, I'm there. I believe that. But here's the deal. You have been far from God. Like you, you've believed this for yourself. You've received forgiveness. You'd call yourself a Christian. But honestly, you've been far from him. And it could be a lot of different reasons for why you've been far from him. Maybe you're far from him because you went through a really painful season of your life. And during that painful season of your life, you're just kind of distant from God. Maybe maybe, maybe that's what happened. Maybe you're far from him because you experienced some church hurt. It's a legitimate thing. You were a part of a church and it hurts you. You're like, man, I don't want anything more to do with God because of this. And you've just kind of been floating. Maybe it was COVID, man. i got to be honest with you. COVID is one of those moments that affected so much, so many people's lives in so many ways, including spiritually. 
And there are a lot of people who, like, one point, maybe this is you, you were, like, in with God. You were following him, and then COVID happened, and you've just been out to orbit. And so my first invitation is actually to you. And I just want to say to you, if that's you, and you're like someone who's like, man, I, I believe this, I've been a Christian, but you've been far from God, can I just invite you back in to the family of God this morning? I just want to invite you. I, I want to say, listen, Crossway is not a perfect church, but this is a church where you can grow and become connected and be seen and see others and know and be loved by others. And I want to invite you in. So that's my first invitation. But here's my second invitation. My second invitation is there are some of you who are here this morning who you have never believed this for yourself. You're here this morning and you've never personally, like for yourself, said, Jesus, forgive my sins. Jesus, I want a new life. Jesus, I need to become a new creation. You've never done that for yourself. And what I want to do is I want to invite you to receive that for yourself. I want to invite you this morning to, to say, Jesus, I want to know you. I want to have new life in you. And I want to be forgiven. So real simply, how do you do that? How do you receive what Christ has done for you? Three things. We call it the ABCs. Number one, A, is you have to admit your sin to God. Everyone say admit. Admit, admit your sin to God. You have to square up with God and say, yeah, like I've messed up. I've sinned. I've been living for myself. I've been my own God. That's really the story. Like, you just, I've been this is my way, not your way. You got to admit and just get honest and say, God, forgive me. Number one, you got to admit my sin to God. Number two, you have to believe. Everyone say believe. You have to believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins and rose again for you. So you've got to believe and make that personal. You got to say, I, I admit, God, I've sinned, forgive me. Now I believe that you, Jesus, you sent your son Jesus to die and rise again for me. That's personal, for me. And he's the one who pays the penalty. It's not that I admit my sin and God, I'm going to make myself better and I'll be better. No, I admit my sin and now I believe, Jesus, you died and took the penalty for me and you rose again for me. So A, you've got to admit. B, you've got to believe. And the third one, C, is this. You have to confess. Everyone say confess. You have to confess that Jesus is Lord. Basically saying, Jesus I'm going to follow you as Lord. Jesus, I'm going to I was going this way, and now I'm going to turn, and I'm going to follow you. And here's what I believe. In a room like this, here's what I know. I know that there's some of you who you, you've had your hand, like this has been you and God. Your hands have been like this towards God. Just stay away. You stay over there. I stay here. There's some of you have walked in like, I don't even know if I believe. Some of you have walked in with your shame and guilt on your shoulders. And I just want to say, today is the day. The Holy Spirit has you for a reason here. And the invitation is that you can today become a new creation, have your sins forgiven, and be brought into a relationship with God. If you admit, you'll believe, and you will confess. And so what I want to do is I want to invite us into a moment of prayer. But I, again, as I was saying earlier, I want this just to be a personal moment of prayer. And an opportunity for you to speak to God and confess your sins to him. So what I want to do is, you know how we started the service with, with this palms up prayer? We placed our palms up like this. I'm going to ask us now to close our eyes and place our palms out like this again. And just hold them there. And, and I want to lead you in a prayer this morning. And if you're here and you're like, John, I want that relationship with him. I want my sins forgiven. I want to know that I have eternal life and you want to enter into that, then I just want, as I pray these words in your heart to the Lord, I want you to repeat these words after me. And there's not some, nothing magical about it. It's just simple, an simply an opportunity for you to speak to your creator in sacred space. And I believe he'll hear you. So if that's you, and this is your moment, and this is your time, and just repeat these words in your heart to the Lord. Say, God, I admit that I have sinned against you. Forgive me for my sin. God, I believe that you sent Jesus to die on the cross and rise again for me. And today I confess that Jesus is Lord and I will follow him. Make me a new creation. Give me a fresh start. Place your Holy Spirit in me and give me the strength to follow you in a new way from this 
moment on. We ask this in the powerful name of Jesus. And everyone together said, amen. amen. Hey, stand with me. And I want to speak a blessing over you before you go. But just a couple things. One, let me speak to everybody who maybe you prayed that prayer for the first time. I just want to say we're going to have our prayer team up in the front. And I'd love to invite you. If you prayed that for the first time, we would love to just grab hands with you and pray over you. Because it's one thing to pray to God. But there's something really powerful and profound when you go to God with someone else and you pray with them. And so when I dismiss, if that was you for the first time, I'd love to, for you to come forward. We'd love to pray over you. We have a gift we'd like to give you, a Bible to place in your hands and just encourage you as, as you step in this journey. And I'd also have to say this about at the end of service. Listen, there's some of you who are here and it's, you just need someone to pray with you. You've got a burden that you've come in with. You've got some, some issues with family members. You just need someone else to grab your hand and say, like, we're going to go to God together. So as soon as I dismiss... Feel free to come forward. We have people available to pray for you. I don't want anyone to leave here without the opportunity for someone to come alongside of you and call out in the name of God for you. So that's number one. Uh, number two, I want to say next week. Everyone say next week. Next week we're starting a new collection of messages called What Happens Next. And we're going to be talking about life after death. There's a lot of questions about that, like what is heaven like, and is heaven the end of the story, and, and here's a big one, like there's friends of mine who believe other religions, well how does that work with God and Christianity, we're going to be exploring some of that. You've got some people in your life that really need to hear that or might have questions about that, and maybe that's you as well, I would love to invite you to come back next week and be a part of that for the next few weeks as we explore life after death, the really big, important questions. Lastly, as we dismiss, we've got a big egg hunt for the kids. I want to encourage you, if you're not coming to receive prayer after the service, feel free to pick up your kids, take them to the egg hunt, and we'll start that in just a few minutes. And to all of our parents and grandparents of teenagers, stop by, see Pastor Chris at the end and get them signed up for our youth camp. It will be a profound, life-changing week for them. All right, Crossway, let me speak a blessing over you as you go. Now, Crossway, as you go. Go and live your life for the glory of God the Father, resting in the grace of his son Jesus, strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit. You are a city on a hill and a light to South Florida. Go in peace. God bless you guys. We'll see you next.